Hi, I'm Arielle Gershman from Winston Timps Lab at Johns Hopkins, and I'm going to be talking about Into the Unknown, the Epigenetics of Repetitive DNA. Um, so today I'll be talking mostly about DNA CPG methylation. So this is the addition of a methyl group on the fifth carbon of a cytosine ring. Um, and we typically associate DNA CPG methylation with the silencing of uh, transcription when we have hypermethylation in the promoter, or the activation of transcription when we have hypomethylation in the promoter and hypermethylation in the gene body. Um, additionally, uh, methylation is typically associated with the repression of transposable elements and hypermethylation in transposable elements or repetitive DNA is thought to repress its activity. Um, but DNA CPG methylation is just one component that makes up the epigenome, which is a complicated, um, uh, a complicated made, up, made up of a multitude of chemical compounds that tell the genome what to do. So this is DNA CPG methylation, but then also there's nucleotome occupancy and chromatin accessibility, histone modifications, protein binding events, and all of these make up the higher order structure of how DNA is organized in the nucleus. And this influences uh, gene expression and um, other DNA elements. So we detect DNA CPG methylation with nanopore sequencing. So the way nanopore sequencing works is we have a single-stranded piece of DNA that flows through a protein nanopore. And as the DNA flows through the pore, changes in current from the top and the bottom of the membrane um, can tell us what bases are in the pore at that time. Um, and so we can see what camers are in the pore. Um, and when this happens, there's a difference in the, the um, current distribution when the camers change from T to C to methylated C. And so here's the density distribution of the current, or the density distribution on the Y and the current on the X, and we can see different peaks for different camers. So we can actually tell the difference between Cs and methylated Cs, um, even though the structure of the bases look very similar. Um, and we can detect these changes with um, a software tool called Nanopolish. And so you can see that Nanopolish is um, highly accurate with an area under the curve greater than 0.9 um, and highly concordant with whole genome bisulfite sequencing with an R squared value of greater than 0.9. Um, however, there are many advantages of using nanopore sequencing for methylation calling over the canonical method in the field, um, which is bisulfite sequencing. So first of all, nanopore sequencing sequences native molecules. So this is without doing any PCR. So this decreases PCR and GC biases. Um, so you can see when we have whole genome biosulfite data, um, the bin ring count versus the GC percentage, there is this um, there is this bias for uh, higher GC co higher GC content, we get less reads. Whereas for nanopore sequencing, because we're not relying on PCR, um, we don't have this GC bias. Um, additionally, longer reads increase mappability to certain repetitive DNA and CG rich regions. So you can see here um, the fraction of mapped reads between nanopore uh, methylation sequencing and, and whole genome bisulfite. Um, in CG islands, we lose a lot of whole genome bisulfite reads because um, number one, they cannot map, and number two, they're less enriched in the sample because of this uh, CG bias. Um, and additionally, with line elements um, and satellite DNA, we see this trend as well. Um, and lastly, long reads give insight into long range epigenetic patterns. So when reads are long, we can span multiple uh, different genomic elements. You can see here um, with this gene, um, we can see differences in methylation between these different alleles. Um, however, there are many limitations to uh, uh, whole genome methylome analysis currently. And the biggest one being uh, the human reference genome, or GRCH38. So GRCH38 is still riddled with these uh, gaps and areas of conflict. So you can see here, all of these purple regions are gaps in the human reference genome that are filled in by ends. Um, so the methylome in these regions has never been examined because we've never had a reference. Um, so getting around this, uh, we've been working with the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. Um, and this group led by Karen Miga and Adam Philippi uh, successfully assembled the first ever complete assembly of a human genome. Um, with only five remaining gaps. So this is the most complete um, human genome assembly ever produced. And you can see here that these gaps in GRCH38 are in this um, gray stripes, and these are almost completely filled in in this new reference assembly. Um, so this, 
This new reference assembly has all of the centromeric regions filled in and um, most of these human satellites and, re and gap regions um, from GRCH38. And so this was a huge collaborative effort with um, people from institutions all over the world. Um, and with that, we were able to look at genome-wide methylation patterns on the first ever complete uh, human genome assembly. And so you can see here, this is a transposable element and every, um, every gray line here represents an individual sequencing read. And for nanopore sequencing, that represents an individual cell. Um, every red dot is a methylated CG site and every blue dot is an unmethylated CG site. So you can see here for this transposable element, it's largely hypermethylated. And we can see here um, where we have methylation frequency on the Y and CPG density on the X, um, CPG density being the number of CG sites per 200 base pairs of sequence. Um, we can see that transposable elements are uh, largely CG dense and hypermethylated. Um, additionally, we can look down here at the promoters of genes and we can see this hypomethylation in the gene promoter. Um, and it's also very CG dense. And so here we see it's largely CG dense and hypomethylated. Um, these events were largely expected. Um, however, something that we can do with the new assembly that we've never been able to do before is revealing the methylome of these unknown regions of the genome, regions that had never been assembled before. And this is largely made up of satellite DNA. So satellite DNA is the telomeric sequence, the centromeric sequence, and um, some other satellite arrays within the chromosome arms. Um, so within the centromeric sequence, we have these multiple different types of satellite DNA, and it's this rich um, repeat structure that makes up the centromere, um, composed of beta satellites, human satellites, and alpha satellites that make up the higher order repeat, and many other types of repetitive DNA that make up this centromeric region. And um, then within here, there is, um, uh, CPG methylation and specific nucleosome occupancy events that overall regulate the transcription of small RNAs and then also protein binding events that aid in proper uh, segregation of these chromosomes. Um, and so for Into the Unknown, we're first going to look at the centromeric higher order repeats, uh, human satellites one and two, and macro satellite repeats. So first, centromeric higher order repeats are these 171 base pair tandem repeats. They're binding sites for the SEMPA histone, which is an H3 histone variant that's centromere associated and thought to aid in proper chromosome segregation. Um, so we see distinctive methylation patterns within the higher order repeat array. And so the higher order repeat array is the functional unit of the centromere. Um, and here you can see that throughout most of the higher order repeat, we have this hypermethylation. Um, that is largely very consistent across this whole higher order repeat. So you can see the higher order repeat here is annotated in orange on all of these chromosomes. Um, and in every centromere we surveyed, we see this um, hypomethylated region and it's consistent across every centromere in the human genome. Um, so this is very interesting to us. And this is um, uh, epigenetic events that have never previously been probed before. So looking further into this, we can see um, this is the higher order repeat array of chromosome seven. Um, <clears throat> we see this hypermethylation and this hypomethylation. Um, we will look, when we look at individual reads, so again, every read is an individual cell. Every red dot is methylated. Every blue dot is unmethylated. We can see this, um, that this hypomethylation occurs across every read, meaning that it, there is no allele specific methylation event and there aren't smaller populations of methylated or unmethylated cells. It's largely consistent across the entire cell population. And then same with this hypermethylation of the higher order repeat. We see that it's largely consistent across the cell population, um, and we don't seem to see any allele specific or, cell type, or um, smaller populations popping out. Um, when we look further into this, centuries can have live and dead higher order repeat arrays. So live higher, or, higher order repeat array, and these are classified by um, Lev Urowski. Um, and the, higher, the live higher order repeat array is typically associated with SEMPA. Um, and this is the actual functional part of the centromere that is needed for, cell, for proper chromosome segregation. The dead higher order repeats are, the monomeric units are more divergent um, and uh, they're typically not associated with SEMPA binding. And so we can see that this uh, methylation pattern of this hypo and hypermethylation 
only is only within the live higher order repeat array, and we don't see it within these dead arrays, um, leading us to believe that this methylation pattern is potentially necessary for um, for the centromeric region. Um, our next question is: Is this hypomethylation associated with kinetochore attachment? Um, and so. The SEMPA marks the site of kinetochore attachment and centromere function. Um, so is there an overlap between SEMPA and this hypomethylation? Does it have some kind of uh, biological role um, for chromosome segregation? And to answer this question, we worked with Gina Caldas from UC Berkeley, who generated SEMPA cut and run data. And then this data was mapped by Karen Miga um, uh, to the centromeric region. And so you can see this hypomethylation occurring here. And we also uh, overlapping this region of hypomethylation is this enrichment of the SEMPE histone. Um, so this is really interesting and definitely probes future questions about how this hypomethylation influences um, the activity of the centromere. Um, next, we looked into human satellite two um, or HSAT2. These make up 1.5% of the human genome. And they occupy some of the largest gaps in HG38. Um, so probing these regions has never really, probing epigenetics in these regions has never been done before. Um, and we see large uh, HSAT2 arrays on chromosomes 1, 10, 2, 15, 5, 16, 9, and 17. Um, so the largest here we see um, is on chromosome 1. And we see that they're mostly hypomethylated, um, which is really interesting because typically we associate repetitive DNA with this uh, repression and hypermethylation. However, the HSAT2 arrays are largely hypomethylated on every chromosome. Um, and they seem to have this uh, periodicity or frequency within the methylation state. Um, so looking into this further, we see that HSAT2 is actually very CG dense and hypomethylated. And we can look at individual reads on HSAT2 and see that there's this kind of periodicity in hypomethylation and hypermethylation um, throughout the array. However, they're largely um, unmethylated. Uh, next, we looked at human satellite one. So these are AT rich sequences, and they're involved in shaping these chromatin looping domains. Um, and they're highly variable between centromeres. So the size of the HSAT1 repeat varies a lot. And it's thought that the length of the monomer can actually affect the size of the loops. Um, and again, we see this uh, hypomethylation of the HSAT1s. So in chromosome three, HSAT1 actually splits the higher order repeat array. And these two higher order repeats on the left and on the right are the active um, live higher order repeats. We still see the hypomethylation only on one side, um, but this, uh, this pattern of hypermethylation occurs in both of these higher order repeats. Um, and it, the same thing for chromosome four, the HSAT1 actually splits the higher order repeat array. And we see that these are largely hypomethylated. When we look more deeply into these regions, we can see that they're extremely CPG poor. Um, and so they're mainly these AT rich repeats. Um, and they have very few CG sites. And there doesn't appear to be a higher order pattern occurring within the CG sites. Um, uh, but they are largely hypomethylated. And lastly, we looked into macrosatellite repeats. So macrosatellite repeats are where the repeat unit can be several kb in length, and they're known to be very CG rich, um, and they're known to be regulated through CG methylation. Um, so a macrosatellite repeat of interest is DXZ4. So this is located on the X chromosome, um, and it is the, the anchoring site for the super looping domains of the X chromosome um, during the process of X chromosome inactivation. So during that process, the X chromosome actually folds back on itself, um, to create the bar body, and this is mediated by the DXC4 repeat. And so we can see this intense periodicity within DXC4 when we look at the methylation state um, throughout the entire array. Um, and we can see that every monomer within DXC4, so these are three KB long monomers, every monomer contains this region of hypomethylation and this region of hypermethylation. When we get to the end of the array, um, there's this intense drop off in methylation and we lose this pattern and this periodicity. And at this point, there's actually an inversion event that occurs um, where the monomers are now going in the opposite direction and this methylation pattern is lost. Um, we also note that within the array, there are monomers that are completely um, methylated and unmethylated. So we go all the way down to zero and all the way up to one. 
but there's also monomers where this um, we only go from 0.5 to 1. Um, so this hypomethylated region, um, only half of the reads um, get this hypomethylation. And so this leads us to believe that there could be some allele specific events occurring. Um, so looking more into the epigenetic regulation of DXC4, on the active X chromosome, um, the promoter in the, um, in, in the DXC4 monomer is hypermethylated. Um, however, in the inactive X chromosome, this promoter region is hypomethylated, and this allows the binding of the CTCF protein. Um, and when CT CTCF is a DNA binding protein that creates these higher order looping structures, and when CTCF binds to every um, monomeric region, then we get this uh, looping pattern that occurs and the actual inactivation and folding of the X chromosome formation of the bar body. Um, so the cell lines that, that we're using are these CHM13 cell lines. They have both an active and an inactive X chromosome. Um, however, they are uh, pseudodiploids. So the active and inactive X chromosomes, the sequence is exactly the same. There are no single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so we can't phase the reads based on sequence. Um, and so, but when we look more deeply into this promoter region, we can see that about half the reads are entirely methylated and half the reads are entirely unmethylated. Um, so we can actually group those reads based on their methylation state and observe allele specific patterns. And so you can see this is the active X allele um, because all of these promoter regions are hypermethylated. And this is the inactive X allele where all these promoter regions are hypomethylated. Um, and we can phase these reads based on just methylation state alone without using any um, SNPs or differences between the sequences. And so we can see here, we're looking at this region here, um, where when we have methylation frequency of 0.5, we have one allele that's entirely hypermethylated and one allele that's entirely hypomethylated. However, we also have this region here where we have a methylation frequency of zero and both alleles are entirely hypomethylated. Um, so this is heterogeneity within the array that has never previously been probed before. Um, it has been thought that the active X allele is entirely hypermethylated and the inactive X allele is hypomethylated, but actually we see these regions where both alleles are hypomethylated or both alleles are hypermethylated. Um, so our conclusions from all of this are that long reads allow probing of epigenetic regulation in large repetitive arrays. And the methylome of repetitive DNA has these higher order patterns. It's not just in this pervasive hypermethylated state. Um, repetitive DNA actually has a lot of higher order regulation going on within the epigenome. Um, but we're just scratching the surface about unveiling epigenetic control of these regions. And we have a lot more to work on in the future. Um, so our next directions for some of these projects are phased epigenetics on diploid assemblies. Um, and then also profiling epigenetic regulatory events with other long read methods. Um, so other long read methods that allow us to map to these large repetitive regions um, and probe epigenetics in these regions. So a method that we would like to try next is exogenous labeling of the DNA to look for protein binding events or nucleosome occupancy. Um, and lastly, we'd like to thank um, everyone who contributed this project. So mainly the Telomere Telomere Consortium. Um, it was an honor to get to work with the consortium on this project, and especially to Karen Miga and Adam Philippi, um, who lead the, led the consortium, and Sergi, uh, Corin, Chirag, and Chirag for um, doing all the mapping and methylation calling, and then Gina for all of the SEMPE data, and Savannah for all of the ProSeq data. Um, and then also I'd like to thank everyone in the TIMP lab who has helped me work um, on this project, especially Winston um, and Isaac for generating a lot of the code that helped us do this analysis. Um, so thank you and thank you to Oxford Nanopore Technologies for inviting me to speak.